July 31st, Nashville, Tennessee, as promised, Ric Flair will walk that aisle one more time. Hello everybody, it's James here, WSI. I'll do some plugs first before I introduce my very special guest, The Rock, The Book, Amazon. You can find it. Owen Hart, King of Pranks. You can find it on Amazon, 4.7 out of 5 stars review for each. You can't say better than that. Well, actually, I suppose you can. Three three points more you can. But uh, as, as I say, I ruin these intros every time. But let me introduce my guest before I dribble myself into a <laughs> into complete nonsense. My next guest, former SmackDown head writer, former WWE producer, former star of every promotion practically out there. And when he wasn't doing that, tag team star, single star, you know he is, he's Road Dog. There he is. <laughs> oh, you didn't know? If you didn't, here I am. And I know I'm all gray now and I look like I ate the old Road Dog, but I swear <laughs> it's me. I can send some fingerprints if I need to. I got plenty on file, that's for sure. Oh, goodness me. How's it going? I, just, I, I uh, do appreciate it's just the morning time, your time. It is very early for me, uh, just because I'm fat and lazy. And so so 10 o'clock in the morning, because I'm on Central Time. We uh, we talked about that. So it's, it's 10 o'clock here for me. Um, so I don't know. I'm just lazy. I, I slept late. <laughs> we, will, uh, we will talk about your entire career. Uh, but first things first, you're going to be talking a bit about StarCast. You're going to be there. Yeah. And the main draw is going to be Ric Flair. I've got to ask you about the main event. Ric Flair coming out of retirement at 70. Is it yep. three still? I can't remember if he's had a birthday 73. 73. Oh, goodness me. So the uh, the main event is him teaming up with Andrade versus Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal. What do you hope to see from that? And what can we expect? And are you going to be just watching it like behind, like, like through your fingers like that? <laughs> well, you know... Um... No, no, I'm not. Uh, I, I know uh, at the, the Hard Knocks gym where he where he went. Um, I know the trainer there. I know the. Uh, I guess the routine has been he's been going through to get ready for this. I think if he was going to die, he would have done it already. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I pray that that doesn't happen. But look, I I want to see. So I started looking at this in a different perspective. When I first heard about Ric Flair having a last match, I thought like everybody else did, or like a lot of people did anyway, Bleh, what do we need doing this for? You know, what? well, then I had a conversation with somebody that made me change my perspective on it. And it made me uh, think about, well, this ain't about you, Brian. This ain't about you, dog. You know what I mean? This is about him and him wanting to go out. Look, if that's what he wants to do, then we should all support him, right? If that's where we're at in the world where we support each other, no matter what, like the old dude wants to go out with a bang. And so let's let him do it. He's done, he's done the hard work to get ready to, to do it. Um, he's got Andrade and Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett in there. So I know they'll have great wrestling as well as some bells and whistles probably on the match. And so, look, I'm, I'm excited to see how it unfolds. And, and look, when you see, when you, I don't know, you got to kind of watch with a, with a, with a curve too. Like he's 73. Don't expect him to be, you know what I mean? What he's not. And so I don't know. I'm interested to watch it, to be quite honest with you. What, uh, as far as the match itself, what would you like to see of the old Ric Flair stuff that you that wouldn't be too dangerous at least? Yeah, well, look, I'd, I'd like to see him take the bump over the top. I'd like to see him get slammed off the top. I'd like to see him uh, go do the crazy woos and drop a knee or drop an elbow. You know, I just want to see vintage Ric Flair. And I, and I think he's going to give it to us because I think that's what he wants to do this for. And man, I don't know. If you're a fan of Ric Flair, and you're seeing this negatively, I think you're looking at it through your lens and not his. Um, and so that's just a suggestion I would make. Try to change your perspective on it if it's negative. And not just because it's negative, but think about what Rick wants. And, and if you're a fan of his, then you want what he wants, right? Uh, I actually interviewed, it's not up yet, uh, George South, uh, one of oh, the yeah. greatest enhancement uh, carpenters out there. And he actually came up with a, a great line for me. And he said, well, what, what's Ric Flair meant to do? Not wrestle? <laughs> that's, that's George South for you. George South is a great friend of my family and a great man. Uh, and I couldn't love him anymore, but what a great line that is. It's just that simple, right? What you expect him to sell insurance. Yeah. You, you expect him to ring up, you ring you up at the, at the grocery store. Like, no, it's Ric Flair, man. He's been wrestling for as long as I can remember. And he's 
and he's going to do it one more time. And, and like I said earlier, I'm excited to see it. Yeah, I um, do you know what? I I, I was exactly the same as you, <clears throat> and then I heard George South say that, and I thought, man, he's right. What is he meant? To-? Yeah, I'll uh, anyway. But yeah, so that's on Starcade Five, so 29th, 30th, and 31st of July. Yeah, what he's what wrestling. a packed weekend uh, too. That that match that we just spoke about with Ric Flair's last match kind of tops it off on Sunday. Um, but man, what a what a studded weekend that is! SummerSlam on Saturday, and and. Uh, um, all the signings, all the autograph signings that myself and Billy Gunn will be involved in and and, and everybody, to, to tell you the truth, StarCast has a hell of a lineup this uh, year and I'm just happy to be a part of it. Absolutely. Are you just doing signings? Are you doing anything else? So, so I'm doing signings and then I'm working pretty closely with uh, those in the know about this Ric Flair last match in the show and the uh, fight TV pay-per-view and you know what i mean so I, i'm i'm uh, working behind the scenes on that show i'll say that much oh okay i was going to probe more then but you've you've, you've oh, said what you're going to say <laughs> yeah well i i just want to leave it there for now because there's a lot of uh, i'm i'm doing a lot of consulting right now and not hands-on we'll see when it comes showtime how hands-on i'll need to be you know what i mean yeah absolutely we'll leave it there then and uh, hopefully we'll get an update of what you do in the uh, in the event at a later date um now, I didn't. Normally, I do. I asked the WSI faithful to send me some questions, and I thought, well, you know what? There's so much material on the road, dog. I can just, I can just do it all myself. But one, <laughs> one email did come in, and uh, I was asked, compelled uh, to read it to you. So this is, uh, this is what it says. Ask, ask Brian. Does he remember the trip from hell when he and Doug Gilbert all made the insane clown posse show? up in Cave in Rock, Kentucky, in a 20-year-old limousine. That's from D Mantell, 72, from Oil Trough, Texas. <laughs> That's, that wouldn't happen to be Dutch, would it? Uh, it, might be. <laughs> it might be. Oh, dirty Dutch, man. I, yes, I do remember that. And only it was only a trip for hell uh, from hell for Dutch because he was the only one sober and so, <laughs> so so uh yes i remember it i have the memories and the physical scars to uh, prove that it happened um it was not a good night for the old road dog but you know what it wasn't a good decade for the old road dog uh, thank god that's behind us now oh uh, yes thanks for your question dutch uh, and that brings up a great old memory you know mm-hmm. i mean like, yeah it was a dark part of my of my life but i do remember that very well and how did that limo driver have so many xanax like it was crazy <laughs> Now, Dutch actually explained in the email exactly what happened, and I didn't read yeah. it. I was just like, I'm not reading this. I want you to tell me. So uh, <laughs> oh, you, oh, I don't know so, the story. So, so I, I don't really know how it transpired because I was already, uh, you know, I was going to the Insane Clown Posse show. And so, uh, and I was an active addiction. So I was, uh, I was three sheets to the wind before we even met up. But then we met up to, to get a ride and Doug had some limousine uh, and it was an older limousine, like a cocaine cowboys uh, limousine. <laughs> and uh, there we were and we got in the car and Dutch was with us. And, and the guy, he said, uh, I said, man, I, I need uh, some pills or so, you know, whatever I was trying to get hammered. And Doug goes, well, tell this guy to pull over. He's got him in the trunk. And I, I, I've never seen so many. He opened a briefcase full of stuff. I was just like, this is a movie scene. Um <laughs> It did. It didn't end well for me. Uh, my music. I got there late. Uh, I was hammered. I was trying to put my gear on and blah blah blah. As soon as my, my music hit, I walked out there. I kept popped up on the ring, and because I came in late, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Davari, but I don't remember to this day. Hit me with a drop kick, and I went off the apron, and I didn't realize the ring was on like a six foot riser. Oh. And so when I, when I went off the apron, I went all the way off of the riser down to the ground and uh, just cut my leg all up. And I ended up getting back in there. Or I don't even know what happened. Next. <laughs> was, it was horrible. I flew home the next day uh, with my dad and my dad was on that trip too. Uh, it was embarrassing, uh, but it was a crazy time. And it was, uh, you know, I heard we had a good time. <laughs> I was going to say, at least you're here to tell at least some of the story that you can remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I was going to say fear and loathing in Las Vegas. That was the, that was oh, the yeah. image, yeah. <laughs> yes, very much so. Very <laughs> much so. And uh, if you've ever been to that 
uh, GCW or, or whatever it's called, not GCW, the ICW, Insane Clown Posse, ICP. I'll get it right in a minute. There's about 12 acronyms going there. Um, if you've ever been to that place, it's either horrifying or it's utopia. You know what I mean? I went one time, uh, that time, uh, on drugs and like, it was like, Oh, great freedom, whatever. And then I went when me and Billy got sober, we both went back and it was the scariest thing I've ever been involved <laughs> in in my life. And I, I went to war. So, uh, so that's saying a lot, but yeah, that that place is a crazy place. And Thanks for the memory, Dutch. <laughs> We've been blamed Dutch for uh, bringing up that. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. I was going to say you're charging for the therapy lessons for bringing up yeah, that whole memory. Yeah, this. Is, well, this is the therapy. You know <laughs> what I mean? And that's that's uh, that's the truth. Like I, I do feel that way. People don't understand just conversation, just talking, talking stuff out is therapeutic. You know what I mean? And, and for me to talk about that stuff and look, I could cry about it. I could, uh, I could be so ashamed that I get high about it. Um, but I'm, it's the past, man. I can't do nothing about it. I can't control it. All I can do is control what I'm doing right now and, and going forward. And so that's the change I've made. And I don't know if it's maturity or what, but you got to grow up at some time. I guess 42 was a good time as any. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, uh, this was something I was going to ask way down the line, but it's sort because of, I've not actually brought up drugs at all in any of the questions. But since you've mentioned them, I'll ask this: Is that back in '99 when you were trying to sort of get on the straight and narrow while you're still on the road, you made the conscious decision of traveling with Triple H in China, who were pretty much teetotal, weren't they? Yeah. And I thought, and I read that, and I thought that is absolutely the smartest thing you can do because if you're trying to, it's the people around you that, are, whether you whether they mean to or not, influence what you're going to do. Yeah. People, places and things. Yeah. And it's uh, and you just have to be conscious of what what am I am I going to go out and party or, uh, you know, I know for a fact now I didn't then uh, that there's nothing good for me out there. Uh, I'm an old man that's married with kids and grandkids. And like, there's no reason for a 53 year old uh, redneck to be out at a bar. Uh, and you know what I mean? And, and you hang out around a barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. And so I go out <laughs> to the bar, I'm going to drink, I'm going to drug, I'm going to, I'll be right back where I started from. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to take you back, not quite to the beginning of your career. I would love to talk about so many different things with you, but we'll do it linear. And I'm going to start with Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And okay. I've asked this many times to many people who are in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and the question to you is, your favorite memory of Jim Cornette flipping out over something incredibly minor? Well, uh, this is, uh, this is <laughs> look, that I have a story for that every television taping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's just, look, that's just how it is. And you either uh, put up with it or you headbutt him. And, and I think he knew... Uh, who would do which, you know what I mean? So, so I'm not saying that, that he, I don't know. Yeah. He flipped out on a lot of stuff, but here, here's my story. There was, we were wrestling on a baseball field and uh, Jim Cornette was backing up the aisle at the Harris twins, uh, Ron and Don Harris were on past him, but backing up the aisle and Cornette was backing up and uh, like they were, they were retreating and he backed into a fan who was just walking across to to get like, uh, you know, his French fries or whatever. Like he was just walking across. And when Jim backed into him, I guess he felt like he was accosted and he turned around and beat that guy to death with that tennis racket. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know whatever came of that, but it was just like a poor dude. It was just like, uh, Hey mom, I got my Coke. I got my, <laughs> and he bumped it and he turned around and he wore that dude out with that tennis racket. Um, I'm sure there was some kind of lawsuit about that or something, but it was in like Kentucky somewhere. So you never know. <laughs> uh, speaking of Kentucky, uh, I've heard this phrase said a few times before, weird Kentucky people, any, any fun memories of uh, some of the uh, stranger fans who may have turned up to the Smoky Mountain tapings or our shows? Well, I, look, at that's not a, uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's there's uh, Southern people and not just in Kentucky, uh, in all the Southern states that are, look, what I consider myself white trash. Uh, <laughs> we love wrestling and, and not all of our teeth are there. And damn you if you don't like it. <laughs> No, I, I, there were, there's some, look, there's some, you know, you go on the video of the Walmart, uh, Walmart people at 3 a.m. Uh, and that's the fan base uh, of the Southern wrestling fan base. And so 
I don't know. You can, you can be enjoy, you can enjoy it and be entertained by it or, or you can yeah. be repulsed. It, well, uh, I would rather enjoy it. Take the money, uh, get <laughs> a payoff. Uh, uh, speaking also of just memories of the territory in general and working the gimmick table and that kind of thing. So this was your first like real proper, uh, weekly sort of gig in wrestling, was it? Yeah. Yes, it was. Um, and, Look, I had I had seen all that before. I had literally done all that before, just going to the shows with my brothers and with my dad and stuff. So I had I had known about working a gimmick table when I was growing up. I knew about, you know, dealing with people and trying to be a people person and and always make the fan happy. And you know what I mean? Like I just kind of learned that by proxy and by watching my father and my brothers uh conduct themselves. And so that 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 wasn't a big deal to me, but the wrestling every night and man, this was a really an opportunity for me to, to learn and grow. And I got the opportunity to work with some great people. Yeah. You know, while I was at Smoky Mountain, Tracy, I worked with my brother, uh, Tracy Smothers, uh, Candido, Chris Candido, um, Killer Kyle, that is a very uh, underrated uh, wrestler fr from the South. So look, I, I loved my time there and it, and it was part of my, uh, like, like, like a young, like a toddler, you know what I mean? Learning everything. That was, that was my toddler years, I guess, in wrestling. I was just learning to, to put my feet in front of the other. And a lot of those great wrestlers helped me do that there. Uh, well, speaking of, I actually wrote some down that I could find that you definitely wrestled. Dixie Dynamite, Robbie Eagle, I mentioned Tracy Smothers. I always yeah. give a shout out to my man, Bobby Blaze, because he's just the nicest guy in the world. That dirty well, Bobby Blaze, what a great guy. Yeah, yeah really, what a great guy. Oh. And and you mentioned uh, Robbie Eagle. I'll uh, I'll give a quick, quick story about Robbie Eagle. You know, Robbie Eagle is his maestro. Um, yeah. So Robbie, I was stationed in, ja in uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina, and that's where Robbie and his family lived. So this was... 30 lord have mercy i don't know how long 30 plus years ago um and me and robbie eagle uh built a, a ring with his father in his front yard and that's where i trained to wrestle was with robbie eagle just calling flare steamboat spots and running them you know what i mean like having no idea what we were doing uh on this horrible horribly rough and, and stiff ring but we just ran steamboat spots tackle drop down leapfrog uh reverse the hip you know what i mean and just bing bang boom and I guess in retrospect, what it did was help my timing a great deal. Uh, but I didn't learn anything about the psychology of wrestling uh, <laughs> until like a year ago. So <laughs> I am going to, I'm sad to say, skip the entire WCW run. I just, I've got over four pages of questions. So I've got to, I've got to skip some stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry yeah to that's say. fine. Look, I, I, I'll, I'll cover it for you. I got $350 a week for doing jobs on their television show. There you go. Then I got hired by WWE. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, hired by uh, WWF at the time, being teamed up with yeah. Jeff Jarrett. And this is the one thing I've always wanted to ask you. Did you get bad knees from having to crouch so low down during publicity shots so, you didn't, so, you, so Jeff seemed taller than you? So, no, because I didn't crouch down. I would spread my legs really far oh. apart. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so so I, I tore a couple of groin muscles. But uh, no, I did not even know how many groin muscles you have. Um, and why are we talking about your groin, for the love of God? There's one thing on um, me that's not hurt at the moment. Yeah, this, is, this conversation's gone off the rails. <laughs> uh, no, look, I loved, I loved teaming with Jeff. The first time I met Jeff was when they put us together. And he was a second generation. I, he might be third generation, to tell you the truth. Uh, but we're both, uh, you know, multi-generational Southern wrestlers. And so we had so much in common from the get-go that uh, our relationship just flourished from there. And I'm happy as a pig in poop to say that my uh, my relationship with Jeff today is better than it's ever been, you know, and, and we've been through a lot together Um but yeah, I love that. So the idea behind that was to make Jeff the star, right? Not to make it look like I'm his heater because that's not what I was. I was his cheater. And there's a big difference. You know what I mean? You got Kevin Nash behind uh, uh, Shawn Michaels. That's a heater. You got me behind Jeff. That's just a cheater. You know what I mean? And so, and, and, uh, and I could take good bumps. Kevin's not going to take a bunch of bumps. You know what I mean? So you need to cough, bro. No. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you were going. 
<laughs> no, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I had a Diet Coke. I'm just doing a very quiet burp. I'm sorry. Oh, burp. I, next time, if you would, please let that sucker rip. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I promise you. I'm in America. I know you are <laughs> over there where you people have, have uh, you know, manners and oh, stuff. Oh, but... still the little, the pinky up and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You did the whole deal. <laughs> you have a little road rash there I saw from your yes, biking. Yes, yes. Just a, just a tiny bit of one. Yeah. I'll, wow. uh, I'll explain wow. it all on the Dutch show more, but yeah. We were, we were talking about Jeff and, and uh, the wide stance. Um, and it has nothing to do with the wide stance in the stall at the bathroom. That's a totally different message um, <laughs> for young, young, young Republicans. Um, but uh, I look, Jeff, Jeff was the star. So how do I make Jeff the star? I crouch down and stand behind him a little bit. You know what I mean? I, I point to him a lot. Uh, I, you know, everything is about Jeff. Ain't he great? You know what I mean? And so that was the whole idea behind that character. And and it didn't, it helped that I didn't look huge next to him. You know what I mean? Because I'm not huge next to him, but I'm a lot taller than him. And, and that's just that, you know. Who really sort of helped flesh out the roadie character and mantra and what he would be? Was it a Vince call? Was it creative? Was it you and Jeff? So, so look, the decision was made by creative. However, the, the, the figuring out what to wear and they literally said, go sit in the audience and watch what the, the wire pullers, the riggers, the, you know what I mean? Let's watch what they do and see what you need to, to wear, see what you need to. So I watched, I sat out there all day and I watched and, and, uh, and I said, okay, look, I just need some black jeans and a, and a, uh, you know, a credential around my, I need a, 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 like a flashlight and a belt probably with a screwdriver or two on it, or, you know what I mean? I don't need, and then as it evolved into more of the character, uh, you know, that was the first couple of times. Then you see the, the, the literally the uh, costume, uh, as, I, as it were, evolve. And now all of a sudden the black jeans have, oh, they have JJ on the back of them. Mm -hmm. Now they now they have actually have a shirt made that says the Ain't He Great Tour, 98, whatever, 95, whatever. And so you saw the the costume evolve and then in, evolved into actual wrestling gear and that 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 was all me and the seamstress, to be quite honest right. with you. Uh, Terry Anderson was her name, and she worked closely with me, with Undertaker, with several guys that um, she did did gear for, and she was great at it. I'm trying to think now. So manager wise, you become a, a manager, a cheating manager. Were you worried that you would always be sort of pegged as a manager and never get to wrestle full time, or was the plan always to introduce you slowly? Yeah, well, it was always to introduce. That was the plan. Um, ha if I had my druthers, I'd have stayed as a manager and stayed as a, like it's so much more fun. Um, it's and I think it's like having a grandchild. Uh, you just don't have the responsibility you did when you're in the ring working. I when I'm in the ring and it's my match all the responsibilities are on my head. When I just have one little spot, two little spots in the match, I can have fun out there until then. You know what I mean? And that's, man, it was so, roadie was so fun. Um, and, and some of the best wrestling I've ever been involved in. There was a, a show uh, that were a match that we did repeatedly, repeatedly with Jeff Jarrett, Shawn Michaels, and me in their corner against Scott and Razor. I mean, excuse me, those are the same people, Scott <laughs> and Kevin. And, uh, and it's one of the best tag matches I've ever seen, ever been involved in. And, and to this day, I, I still think about that match and go, and we were, it was, we were young. It was 95. We were all young and um, nobody was really that over yet. These shows we were doing them at uh, were less than shows and stuff. And so we almost felt like let's really have some fun with it. You know what I mean? Let's cut loose. By the time we got into a, uh, like the garden, I think we did it in the garden one time. Um, by the time we got there, the match was perfection. You know what I mean? And it was it was so much fun to be involved in. So I loved that period of my career. Yeah, it, uh, it this comes from the period of your career where on house shows, you were basically doing the same match like 90 times. So when it finally went to a big stadium or on <laughs> yeah, TV, it was perfect. Yeah, it was perfect. And uh, and uh, if you weren't injured by then, you, you if you made it to the pay-per-view, you had a damn good match. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, This will be a very quick question. I know you've been asked this a million times. You and Jeff leave in your house too. Uh, if anybody wants to see the full story on that, you go to the OU you Didn't Know podcast or YouTube channel uh, and you can find it there. And you and Jeff leave due to 
an issue with contracts. What specifically was the issue with the contracts? Was it just money and you were unhappy with that? So, so it was an issue with a contract. Um, I was young and dumb and uh, full of rum and, uh, <laughs> and all sorts of other things. Um, and so I just literally left because Jeff was. Jeff was leaving. And, and he told me, he looked me right in the eye when he was laying on the mat and I was leaning over him. And he said, Brian, you don't have to do this. I'm doing this for me. You don't have to do this. And I said, hell, I'm doing it for you too. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know any better. And I, that's look, that's how I made a lot of my uh, major life decisions until I was 42 years old. And it's literally, yeah, screw this. Let's go, dude we'll party. You know what I mean? Like whatever. And, and that, that was how I faced life, even though I was a father of two and been married 15 years at the time. Uh, you know, I still was living life that way. So look, that, that was Jeff, Jeff, we've been working with razor a whole lot. Um, and I think razor was getting paid in full. And I think Jeff thought he wasn't getting paid fairly and that's business. You know what I mean? And so business, uh, business deals with facts <laughs> and the facts don't give a flip about your feelings. You know what I mean? And so it, 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 it that's a business thing. Jeff's got to make the right business deal for himself. He is his own product. He is a businessman. So he has to make that. I just went with him because I was stupid. And, and look, it was probably, uh, we talked earlier about you got to go through, you got to go through the fire, through the limit, to the whatever. Uh, Shaka Khan, you can look it up. Mm -hmm. It's worth a Google. Uh, but so, so, so he, I was just leaving with him, man, and, and doing whatever. Like I, but, but in retrospect, I, I look back and I go, man, that might have been the best thing I ever did. I had no idea. Uh, look, I still don't care about the value of a dollar. Uh, I just said, money doesn't, it doesn't impress me. I know you need it to keep the lights on, but, uh, but that's, that's about it. If you think about it, you take what's important with you when you die and it ain't no dollar bills. Um, but, but yeah, so I didn't care about that stuff then. I've changed my perspective on it now, but only because I have children and grandchildren. I want to be able to leave them something. Uh, but yeah, Jeff made a business decision and I went with him for, yeah. for sure. Craps and giggles, you know. Uh, this might be like a, a one-word answer, uh, but Jeff comes back at the end of 95 for like a few weeks and then disappears again. Were you contacted to come back with him or were you just sort of still in the USWA and didn't get the call? No, yeah, I was still in the USWA. Look, he he showed back up, then went to WCW. and I, I, I but, but that's, you know, that's where he was in his career and I wasn't there yet. And so truth be told, I didn't deserve to be there yet. And I needed... I needed some more ironing uh, to get out some wrinkles. And, and I did learn how to wrestle at USWA. I then went to Germany and wrestled uh, for a while over there, learned a lot there, came back. And that's when they called me back to do the real double J deal. Uh, and I was having my first baby at the time. I was just like, I'll do anything you want me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Could have come at a better time. I'll ask one USWA based question. And I've heard an interview with Jerry Jarrett, that he believed that uh, he was Flex Cavana at the time, The Rock. Yeah. He was basically inspired by you as far as promos were concerned in USWA. Was that anything he's ever said or that you thought of? No, no. Um, I, look, I do. And, and, and whether this is factual or not, this is in my head. So, so there's a lot of strange things going on in there, <laughs> having said that. Um, I used to say, if you smell what I'm cooking. I used to, I said that on several promos down there while we were together. Now, look, what I'm not saying is that rock stole my crap because I stole everybody's crap. I stole boogie woogie man's crap. I stole my dad's crap. I stole Brad's. You know what I mean? I tried to steal everything I could because you look around and you see what's good. You take that and you leave the rest. And then you come up with some stuff of your own and so, so I'm not, I'm not saying, and I want to be perfectly clear about that because I just think that's, I just don't, I don't want to say that he did that, but I did do that on a couple. And that may be what Jerry was talking about. Maybe it was, I think it was more like as well, just the confidence to get out there and just, you know, be full of personality on screen. 
as yeah. well. So maybe well, that's the kind of thing. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it was. Maybe it was. It was just, uh, I've told that story before and, and Billy always ribs me and goes, oh my God, whatever. And I'm like, look, I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that happened. I'm not. <laughs> and so two things can be true at once. So Road Dog, of, of what I'm gaining from this is Road Dog is definitely saying that he, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, one more thing well, about, sorry. Look, what, so, so also, if you steal something from somebody and get it really over, it's yours. Mm. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's that's just the that's just the law of the jungle. I will ask you one more thing about the Rock, actually, and I think we're talking very early '98, a house show, and the New Age Outlaws are teaming with the Rock versus somebody else. I can't remember. And the audience is chanting, "Rock, he sucks. Rock, he sucks." And you get the microphone, and you say, "Hang on, guys, he doesn't suck." He's, do you remember what he said? No. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll tell you. Uh, r- roughly, it was, uh, he doesn't suck because his timing was good, he looks great, plus he's a pretty decent guy. <laughs> maybe maybe I was just trying to get them to see a different side of, <laughs> of, of The Rock. Oh. Hey, and, but you know what? Look, I, and I, I don't want to go on about Jeff Jarrett, but but like the same, Jeff's the same way about what I said about Rock. Um get to know him before you judge him. (laughs) You know what I mean? Everybody hates Jeff Jarrett. Well, well, okay. You hated Jeff Jarrett, the wrestler, Uh, Jeff Jarrett, the guy is a different dude. You know what I mean? And, and, and at that point they hated rock, the the, the wrestler. And I was trying to get, I was trying to humanize him. Mm. That must've been the loveliest promo of, you know, I never heard it or anything, but it was written somewhere. But uh, anyway, I will move on from that. (laughs) And I will move on from that. And I'm going to give you a bit of a game name association. I'm going to give you a sentence. And you tell me who best fits the description, the sentence that I give you. And okay. I'll, I'll bet you I know exactly who you're going to say for the first one because everybody says him. The funniest person in the locker room. Right now? Ever. This is any promotion ever. Uh, it's, it's Brad Armstrong or <laughs> Dean Malenko. Everyone says Brad Armstrong. Okay, okay. Uh, but so, so, so here's what I'll add to that then, because you're right. Funniest guy in the world, and, and you mentioned earlier about maybe The Rock and that confidence, whatever. Brad, Brad and, I, and look, I miss him, and God rest his soul, and I can't wait to be with him again, but he couldn't turn it on when that red light was on. But when it was just you and him or him and a group of guys, the funniest friggin' guy you can imagine. Now you put Dean Malenko with him and it's like a, uh, you know, <laughs> Costello, uh, uh, whatever that, those two guys were, <laughs> Albert and Costello. Uh, that's not it was like Flugel all, Streets and slowly I turned. It was that them or was that the other ones? <laughs> that was the three stooges. Oh, was oh that no, three I don't stooges? know. I have no idea, dude. I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, Brad Armstrong. That was my first answer. And do you know what? I mean, everyone said it. I mean, even Adrian Street, when I yeah. asked him, said Brad Armstrong, which everyone thought just the world of him. Um, last man standing at the bar. Oh. Um, Ron Simmons. Really? Yeah. Name He's a man's heard. man. He's a man's man. He what? is all man, my friend. Uh, what was his drink? Uh, Jack Daniels. Ugh. Yeah, it's harsh, but everybody drank. A lot of guys drank. Look, I would say Brad Shaw would be right there with him. Mm. Um, and if any crap went down, I'd want to be right there with them. <laughs> uh, the most beautiful woman wrestler valet worker. Working right now? All of these are ever. So I, I know this is going to sound funny. Or no, no, it's not going to sound funny. I don't know why I said that. Um, it's just going to be out of nowhere. Like, I think Paige uh, was one of the most beautiful women. Like I, and, and it was weird because she's such a young girl and I got daughters and everything. Like, I wasn't looking at it like, like a weird old creepy man. I was looking at it like she's a Mona Lisa. You know what I mean? Like, she heard she's got a jawline that's to die for. She... Look, I, I, you can tell I've, I've thought about this. Um, she, 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 yeah, but apparently I'm coming off as the creepy old man. But she, she, I thought she was beautiful. I just really did. Uh, Soraya will be at Starcast 5 in Nashville in a couple of weeks. Look at that yes, for a second. Soraya, that's her, uh, that's her maiden name. I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> here's one for you. Smelliest wrestler. We get a couple of the same names for this as well. Oh, Jack Gallagher. <laughs> okay, never had that one before. <laughs> Have you not? No. It's always Who Vader. Oh, Vader. Well, Vader's, you know what Vader, 
he was just a big sweaty man. You know what I mean? He, he didn't stink per se. His mask stunk like that because it was just leather and sweaty and all, you know, and it's kind of hard. What do you do? Wash that and then dry it. Then it ruins the leg. Like it's, it's difficult um, to be a man of that size and not sweat through your trash, you know, but I, I don't think he stunk as much as say uh, like, cause I'm talking about body odor. You know what I mean? Like, Oh God, pungent, like sex Panther. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it's, it's not good. Um, and I'm sticking with Jack Gallagher. Hey, great guy. I love the guy. I would hug him with his BO mm. and, and rub my forearm on his underarm. And I would, <laughs> mm. But you're so much <laughs> you're so much taller than him that you know it'd take a while for yes. the smell to get to you he anyway. He would probably go around my waist. Yeah. <laughs> we'd have to chalk we'd have to chalk off and hug twice because I'm so friggin' fat. <laughs> uh, I've got so many of these, I'll cut a few of them out. The stiffest slash most reckless in the ring. Oh, well, there's a difference there uh, because the stiffest is Bradshaw or, or, or Ron Simmons. And, and, but they're safe stiff. Mm. And, and so as there's a, so much of a difference between stiff and reckless. Um, you know, reckless is, uh, is just being clumsy in there. And, and I, I'm going to be quite honest with you. Uh, some of the guys that are on top right now, and I'm not going to say a name because it'll just, it'll just get me in trouble. Uh, but some of the guys that are on top right now are the clumsiest two, two left feet guy I've ever been in the ring with. Um, and I'm sure he would tell me that I'm, I suck too. Uh, but, but that's, you know, well, it is what it is. I'm not saying the name, so don't try. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, detectives out there, figure out who, uh, who uh, yeah. Road Dog's talking about. Let me see. Yeah, and the there's, there's some that know. <laughs> I ah, guarantee you. Is is this inside the company, or maybe a few fans have maybe picked up on it as well? Uh, no, it's not inside the WWE. Uh, it's in it's in in American wrestling. Okay, right. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, man, that's that's a mystery, right? Uh, people figure yeah. out who it is. Uh, it's Chris Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hold it any longer. Oh, uh, it's well, actually Chris. Yes, it is. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, and look, I love Chris Jericho. I think I'm a huge fan of how many times he's reinvented himself and continues to do so. And I watched uh, like a fan, and I don't know when this airs, but I watched last night as he and Ke Eddie Kingston uh, beat each other up with barbed wire. You know what I mean? And so I'm a fan of Chris Jericho. However, sometimes in the ring, man, it, it was you know tackle, drop down go to hit the ropes and you step on my hand. Like, what? <laughs> didn't you see the guy laying down here? <laughs> like, I, so it was just weird stuff like that, that made it. And excuse me, he's a hockey guy too. So he's rugged and rough. And, and when you're a little, I don't know, look, I, he's a lot more athletic than I am. So it's hard for me to critique. I just know what I experienced, you know? Mm, I, I, you know, this is something else I'd written down for later, but I really was hoping for a, Big old long feud. I mean, apparently you weren't hoping for that, but I mean, I was hoping for a big long singles feud between you two guys because I thought, well, two of the best talkers. I'd seen well, Jericho and WCW, and by the time he got to the WWF, he's even written in his own book that basically not a lot of people thought he was any good because he just everything seemed to be going wrong for him. Yeah. Well, look, I, I thought he was good when he got there, and that's the first time I, I had met him earlier. I'm sorry, I had met him earlier in Smoky Mountain uh, when he when him and uh, Lance were the thrill seekers, uh, but early on one of them like broke their arm or something working. And so by the time I got there, they were kind of out of the loop, mm -hmm. uh, but I met them. So um, look at the time I was still in active addiction and God knows when I was going to be fired, but it was going to be either I was going to die or be fired any day now. And so at that point it was, who do we use to get Chris over in a positive way that the people kind of dig. And I was that guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time in active addiction, that bothered me. You know what I mean? In retrospect, I see it's phony baloney wrestling, man. And it's just a creative decision that was made. And I totally understand it now that I've worked on the other side of the, of the uh, train tracks, uh, you know, in the office and in the writing and stuff, I totally understand utilizing that guy that the people like to get this guy over. And that's, I'm not saying that he, him, uh, beating me got him over. I'm just saying we want him to come in in a positive light. 
How do we do that? He beats Road Dog in a couple of matches. He beat me in a couple of matches. You know what I mean? <laughs> like he power bombed me through a couple of tables. Like I, he's he's a strong, scrappy dude. And kudos to him for where he sits right now. Um, and and where he sat all in between. Because look, he's a smart guy who has done a lot of things, not just wrestling. Um, and he's done them well. And so I don't mean uh to say that, you know, just cause he's a little, just cause I found him a little awkward in the ring. I don't, I'm not negating any of his accomplishments. I want that to be no, clear as well. No, absolutely not. Um, these next few will probably just be like one name answers, uh, heaviest smoker of regular cigarettes. Uh, have I smoked regular cigarettes? No, no. Uh, any, no, the person in any wrestling company who was the heaviest smoker. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, well, Pat Patterson and Jack Lanza. Uh, <laughs> those are the two. Um, you know, in WWE, not a lot of people smoked. Uh, I mean, it was just it's frowned upon and, and not a lot of people smoked. So I haven't been around a whole bunch of heavy smokers, but Jack Lanza would light up on an airplane when it was illegal <laughs> to smoke on an airplane. So uh, I've seen some people that are heavy smokers. Nicest person in wrestling. Just too nice for the business. Well, it was Bobby Eaton. Is, have you heard that one before? Yes, I may have done. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah definitely. I'll move on. Um, the most memorable thing you saw happen on an aeroplane? Hmm. Oh well, uh, <laughs> and never mind. It was a, it was a, so it was a charter flight. Uh, with only WWE talent, WWF at the time. I won't go into it, but I've seen some crazy things on airplanes. Also saw a man die in first class. Um, so that happened. Of natural causes? Or- yeah, 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 yeah. He had a heart attack. Oh, God. Yeah, there's like some sort of like code, like if you're in the cinema and then someone says, uh, like if there's a fire or something, do they have like a special code for like, Mr. Mister something to the front desk, please, or whatever, you know, to sort of like announce that a corpse has happened yeah no they uh they uh, uh you're talking about on the airplane yeah 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 they they immediately said do we have a doctor on board do we have a, it was kind of a panicky thing uh, because everybody was panicked you know what i mean and so it's you know that that's the first thing in any situation is okay remain calm and think and that's not what anybody does <laughs> They're like, oh my god this guy's dying and uh and everybody starts screaming i'll give you a couple more than loudest spot caller John Cena. Okay. A hardest deliverer of chair shots. Oh. Uh, man, it depends on who you're in there with and what's going on and if you've pissed them off. <laughs> but uh, but Bradshaw, again, would swing a chair and had no problem <laughs> swinging a chair. Last one then. A most memorable backstage fight. Hmm. Uh, probably Sean and Brett and, uh, and, uh, it was such a, for me, cause I was there, I wasn't right in the room, but, uh, by the time I got in there, Lawler had broke them apart and, uh, Lawler was older and, and not, not the toughest guy in the world. So it was like weird to me that he broke those two guys apart who were fighting. I, I just don't know how how bad either one of them wanted to fight, but I feel like they saw each other and they kind of had to. And so they locked up, you know what I mean? And in, in a shoot, like lock up with hair and eyes and all kind of stuff. And, and, and uh, like, by the time I got in there, they were still in that position, like not really any punches thrown and Lawler was, was breaking it up and they kind of did let each other go and, 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 and break it up. And so look, I, I do think, I guess in their credit, they weren't, they weren't going to fight and, and hurt each other and beat each other up. They were doing business together. But I feel like they butted heads a lot, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you hear what happened to the chunk of hair that Shawn Michaels ended up losing? <laughs> no, no. Jim Cornette found it in Vince McMahon's <laughs> office. He put it in a bag and gave it to his ex-wife. Oh, well, his wife at the time. <laughs> I do not doubt that at all. Um, <laughs> one, one bit. What a souvenir, eh? What a souvenir. As crazy and carny as that is, I don't doubt that one bit. <laughs> we shall move on then. That's the end of the game. We'll move on. We'll talk about the New Age Outlaws then. And something that really occurred to me while I was just reading through your career is, and the story goes that you and Billy, the only people you could beat on the roster was each other, and you just got put together 
and you were given time to see if it worked. And that yeah. strikes me as something that is sorely missing today. I, look, I agree 100%. Um, I, I don't look at it, and I don't think anything I would say uh, would change the minds of people who think exactly what you did, how you just said. I, I agree with you, by the way. It's, it's not, uh, things aren't tried. And, well, things are tried. They're just not given the time. Um, and, and so I feel like they don't, you know, if you would have gone off maybe the first time we were together, maybe it wouldn't, maybe you go like, oh yeah, whatever. But then after five times of seeing us and now you see, and, and we're evolving to get a better response out of you. And so we were given the time, man. And that's, that's what, I don't know if it's because, you know, no longer is the WWF at the time uh, an independent company. It's not, it's a publicly traded company. And so now uh, is there more pressure on the upper echelon to produce? And, and do they feel like you don't have time to let things build? We're moving on. You cut bait and you go. And, and that's a philosophy. And that's a strategy. I don't know if it's the right one or if it's the one I would, I would take. Um, I, and I'm interested, AEW lets things breathe a little bit. Um, I, I think it, to the negative of that is they have so many people on the roster that that there's people I don't know that, that wrestle sometimes, and I'm just like, I don't have any idea who this is. And so I just feel like they could use a, a little more character development stuff, and, and it's almost like they rely on their own guys to do the vlogs or the whatever to, to kind of get their character out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, th this is just off the top of my head, but it, well, it's not off the top of my head. I wrote it down. I don't suppose the honky tonk <laughs> man was ever going to be the New Age Outlaws uh, manager, was he? No, never, uh, never. Um, you know, Honky and I ha have a have a storied path and, uh, past, and I'm sure it's me. I was a young punk and arrogant, and he had been somewhere in the business, and and uh, and I hadn't. But what we I, we didn't get along during this particular era. Um, but we, I just saw him not too long ago, uh, you know, time heals all wounds. Um, and I've realized I was a complete blithering idiot when I was younger. And uh, I, I think everybody who I have encountered in the past when I was, you know, in active addiction, I have tried to make amends to and apologize to for anything I did, even the stuff I didn't remember. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're in a good place now, but we've had our ups and downs. Was there any suggestions for the original New Age Outlaws before you joined D-Generation X that you thought that was a good idea or a bad idea, but just never came to fruition, never went on TV? Yeah. So it, look, at if you realize, and I, and I learned this, and this is a gratuitous plug, going through the research on Oh You Didn't Know, which is my podcast. Where uh, can people get that uh, podcast, by the way? You, so you go to Road Dog Links, and it has everything there. RoadDogLinks.com, excuse me, R-O-A-D-D-O-G-G-L-I-N-K-S.com, RoadDogLinks.com. And you can find everything. Look, you, you also get it on Apple, Spotify, uh, YouTube, all, all the platforms. Everywhere you find uh, you know, podcasts, you can find it there. Uh, that was a great gratuitous plug. Thank, thank you, you for, for, yeah, for, no, thank thank you. You for teeing it up. Um, <laughs> We, we were talking, and you'll find out on that podcast, I forget what I was talking about a lot. We were talking about... Uh, New Age Outlaws ideas that never came to fruition yes. in the original film. So if you remember how quick, thank you for that, by the way, if you remember how quick all this was, there was no ideas for the New Age Outlaws other than, and look, I, I would argue we were given, look, we both, <laughs> we're like twins. We both did that at the same time. Shut up now. Um, I, we, I did the chair we, rising thing, by the way, at the yeah, same time as yes, Road Dogg. Exact same time. There I go again. So the Outlaws were only together for about three months before we joined DX. And so at the time, it was a huge jump uh, in, in my mind and in Billy's mind from New Age Outlaws, where we were, um, to Degeneration X, where we where they said we were going to go, and, I, and we were excited about it. Um, having said that, there were no other ideas, but they wrote us into some stuff. Like we were stealing, uh, excuse me, cowboy hats and and uh, shoulder pads and and shaving people's heads, and they were they were writing us into some really good stuff as a tag team. So that not only were they giving us time uh, to flesh out exactly what this was, but they were putting us in a positive light all the while. And so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, most importantly, you won. You won every match pretty much, one way or another. 
we did. And, and right when they put us together, and then we lost a couple or we won a couple by DQ or whatever. But to me, that never, it never mattered, man. Beat me every night, but give me that microphone and hit my music. And I, I promise you, I will make you uh, remember me for that and not for laying flat on my back, looking at the building lights, you know. I've got to ask this, Survivor Series 1997, it's not the question you think it's going to be, because is this going to be the night where Bradshaw knocks you out twice? <laughs> yes, it is exactly the night where he knocked me out twice in the same match. How did he do it? So one was a lariat and one was a power bomb. <laughs> um, and it just so it, this is so weird and so masochistic, but but it's the way wrestlers think. I got knocked out, but I but the clothesline was not uh, a finish or anything, so it it knocked me out. I rolled under the ropes and I just couldn't get my head together. But as soon as I got my head together, I saw what was the next spot that I was supposed to follow and come back in and do. And I, I went back in and <laughs> did that power bomb. Oh, I was out again. And so I, that time I woke up later in the evening, I think. <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, it was, look, that was, you used to rub some dirt on it and get back in there. You know what I mean? That was just the mentality because you know what you know. And we didn't know anything about head injuries, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with uh, Survivor Series 97, I'm wondering, do you remember the next night in, I believe got it as Ottawa, do you remember the speech that Vince McMahon gives the entire roster about Brett leaving? Uh, vaguely. yeah, Yes, I do remember him giving a big speech with a big black eye. Um, <laughs> I do remember that. I do remember him telling us uh, what went down. And look at the time, it was... For, for me personally, and I, again, I'm speaking for me personally, and I say this a lot, but it's, it's just where I was at. I was in active addiction. We were on top of the world. I didn't give a crap who left. It made more space at the top for me and Billy, yeah. you know what I mean? Or, or DX or whoever. And so it wasn't, it wasn't like a, I wasn't on one side or the other. I was just like, okay, what's, what's, when's, what's the show? What are we doing tonight? You know what I mean? Like, can I go get high now or should I wait? <laughs> you didn't have a dog in the hunt basically. I did not. I did not. And look, I'm, I, me and me and Brett were friends. Uh, I think we still are, you know what I mean? I haven't seen him in a really long time and there's been a few things up and down about it, but, but I, I, I didn't have a dog in the hunt. We'll move on to DX then. And all this way through, we're only just at T Generation X. I do apologize. I've just, I, That's I, all right. I, I write questions like I'm writing and like a, Four part novel, I'll tell you, dude. Yeah, well, and I answer them like I'm right. So <laughs> hey, no, that's uh, what we want. I'll, I'll try to be more succinct. No, absolutely not. You, as much detail as possible, please. Um, D Generation X, what did you think of Triple H, Shawn Michaels, China, and Rick Rude version of it? And did you think when you were, got the call that you could improve upon that? So, look, I loved that one. I think everybody did. I love that version. And there's been a couple of iterations and that, that was the first one. And that's why I think it, uh, that was the key to its success. You know what I mean? It was the first one and they were pushing the envelope. And so they got a ton of attention um, in a, in a, if this makes sense, in a negative, positive way uh, 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 that we're going to start drawing that we, that we've moved the line and that we're going to go further. And so I look, I think if they hadn't have set that bar uh, or or knocked it down and reset it, I, DX wouldn't have been anything. So they were the foundation, you know what I mean? And I got no doubts about that. Now, if you're going to ask me which which iteration I thought was the best, of course, it's going to be, you know, me and Kid and, and <laughs> Hunter. And, and, and look, Sean would have been there too. He was just injured. And, and uh, I, I'm not sure if he had lost his smile then or not, but he was injured, I think. And, uh, and he just couldn't be there. They were great with him. I'm sure they would have been great we would have been great with him too. You know what I mean? He's great. How do you not be great with Shawn Michaels? But I loved the one that it was like, it was like the gen, you know, the sergeants, it was like a fire team. And we were, uh, when, cause I go back to my military training and my military experience. And I think, yeah, those four guys and that big, bad chick could, do, could just start trouble and beat the crap out of people, but then they could run and scream too and be scared. And you know what I mean? Like it was, I don't know. I thought we were a great unit. I'm wondering who we all, biggest supporters then so we've got i think jim Cornette's pretty much off the uh off the creative by december of 97 vince russo is therefore yeah. head of creative at the time triple h and Shawn michaels were they sitting on creative meetings at the this time and did they suggest you and billy 
So I, I so here's what I, I don't think they were sitting in in creative meetings, but I think they had the year of the creative writers and it was Russo and uh, Russo was the one that gave me and Billy the opportunity. We had gone to him every week and said, we're not doing anything. Just put us together because we, we knew we had good chemistry in the ring and our timing was good together. And, and we kind of knew what each other was doing without conversating too much. And, and so it was obvious to us that we were pretty good together. And, and we thought, I don't know why I'm looking over here. Uh, I was <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian, 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 we're down. My head is up here. My eyes are up here, Brian. Uh, but, uh, oh my God. It's one of those. <laughs> where I, forgot, where I forgot what we were talking about. Vince again. Russo like it. Yes, Vince Russo was the writer. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and and uh, he was the only one we dealt with, but he liked me and Billy. So I think if they pitched, he may have pitched us to, the, to them or they may have uh, collaborated on that. I don't know how that got started, but look, it, me and Billy were excited to, to do it. I also don't know if Sean knew about he was going to need back surgery at this time. And did they need to go, hey, we have to continue this? Mm how and who you know what i mean and i'm just thankful they picked us yeah absolutely there's a rumor killer i don't know if it's true or not true hopefully you'll be able to tell me that the godwins were at one point considered to join dx um i never heard that uh but with I, I love those two guys. I would have gladly been in a faction with them, no matter what you called it. You could have put an I in between DX, and I would have still joined it with them. Um, and so I, I love those guys. I just never heard that. Never heard that. Before. No, okay. I, I think maybe this might have been later in '98 when there was Southern Justice, which actually I believe oh. is a name that you coined for them as well. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so look, I'm good with names. What am I going to do? Hey, hey. Uh, make a, make a friggin' t-shirt. Um, but yeah, so I love those guys. Just never heard that rumor. Oh, okay. I lived with the, I lived with those guys uh, early in WCW years. Tex Slazenger and uh, I can't remember the guy's <laughs> yeah, name. What's it called? Shanghai Shanghai Pierce. Shanghai Pierce. How did that go? Oh my god, some great stories for those guys, man. Woo. Different time. Come on, in you three, uh, who stays up at the bar the latest then, who who can stick it, out? It was, it, it was, but we wouldn't go to the bar so much as we'd go to the bar for a little while and see what was happening, but then we would go to the room. And it was more about each other's, it was more about the camaraderie, you know what I mean? And and then, of course, the drugs yeah. uh, and alcohol. Um, but but we shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that, guys. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't either. Well... This, Public service announcement. Now, this might be something of a similar question then. Who was in trouble with the office more, you or Sean Waltman? I, I think me. Now, Sean may argue with that, um, but I never saw his trouble. You know what I mean? Like, I only saw mine. Um, but the one time that they saw us smoking a joint in the parking garage of that of that uh, venue with Ben Stiller, that was not us. Ben Stiller? Oh, he was on. He <laughs> Wait, was on a roll, wasn't he? I mean, that what was happened? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, he was. Yeah, Jeff Jarrett beat him up. I seem to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put him in the figure four. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, I remember that right. I remember it vividly because that was one of the videotapes I had that someone gave me. I, I believe D'Lo Brown, after the figure four, carried him out like. Uh, you know, he was carrying a, a bride over the threshold. <laughs> a giant Jewish baby. <laughs> with I've adopted this baby. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he was a, he's a great guy. Very funny. Okay, then. So I've got one more question about DX, or maybe two. I didn't, I didn't actually read through all the scripts. I should have done, I suppose. Was, in your eyes, in 1999, Kane an official member of DX or not? Yeah, I think he was. I think he was a member of Degeneration X. And look, I I think it would be different uh, if we were talking about Virgil, um, but we're talking about <laughs> Kane. And so I'm saying, I'm saying, uh, I think Kane was a part of DX. Did Did you ever have to stifle laughter when occasionally I, I heard it at least once? We go, mm, suck it. <laughs> yeah, no, I never stifled my laughter. I just laughed <laughs> uh, because that was awesome. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist doing the impression. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I was just actually going to—I was going to ask you about Chris Jericho then, but we've already dealt with Chris Jericho, so I'm going to go to. 
The final nitro. Now, people, some some people out there might be asking, why am I asking Road Dog about the final nitro? Could you explain uh, the story? Oh, I can explain. <laughs> I can. I can explain. So I had been fired from the uh, from the WWF at the time. Um, I live in Pensacola, Florida, which is right down the road from Panama City, yep. which I think is where the uh, the nitro was being held. I thought to myself, I just came off. WWE TV, WWF at the time, uh, as the road dog, pretty decent run. Um, let me go try to get a job. Let me go try to shake some hands and look some people in the eye and, and, and get a job. So I drive down there and I pull in and the first people I see is Gerald Briscoe and <laughs> Pat Patterson and Shane McMahon. And I go, what the, f- <laughs> you know, what, what, and they go, Hey, hey, and they, they just think I'm coming to say, Hey, or whatever. And, uh, it totally derailed my, uh, my, my job hunt. Uh, so I got hammered and after the show, we all got in a fight at a bar. Oh, good. Who, who was involved that we may know? I probably started it. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, Shannon Moore tells a good story about it. Oh, Shannon Moore. Right. Okay. Then I'll remember the name of Shannon Moore then. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm skipping all of TNA. We've just got so much to ask. I didn't write I, That's quite all right. I'll cover it up. <laughs> uh, I was teamed with a, a Cuban, an African-American, and a redneck. Then I was teamed with Billy Gunn, my old partner, where we tried to reclaim lightning in a bottle. Didn't happen. Uh, some of my greatest promo work was during TNA, though, where I got a lot of time to talk, and I kind of got to freestyle. Um, so I had a good time doing that. And then I got fired for drugs and alcohol. Yes. Um, there's my there's my TNA run. Fair enough, then. Oh, that, that's, that's a lot encapsulated in, what, like nearly 10 years as well. So it's just <laughs> quite good. Yeah. Um, do you know, like, so at the time, I'm, I, I remember the Voodoo Kim Mafia thing. I won't be talking about TNA. This is going to WWE. And I also remember the RF video shoot, which I loved. An RF video shoot, you know, where they film you in a hotel or whatever. Yeah. They're normally yeah. crap. Uh, but you and Billy really put on a show, and it was really, really good. Um, how did the call go uh, when you were brought back to WWE? Was it a Hall <laughs> of Fame thing first? And did you ever have yeah. a heart heart with Vince and Triple H over... Over. So I, I had talked to Hunter uh, prior to the uh, 2011 Hall of Fame induction of my father. And so I had talked to him already. That actually only the qu- question only came up one time when he said, Hunter said to me, hey, what was with that VKM stuff? And, and I said, oh, dude, come on. He said, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And that was that. I, I don't think Vince ever saw it. I don't think Vince would care to see it. Um, so it wasn't a big deal. It was, and, and the truth be told, and I told Hunter this over time, dude, I was an active addiction and I needed money and I needed to pay my bills. I would have said I was going to shoot you in the head if they would have let me, you know what I mean? If they'd have told me to, um, of course I wouldn't have done that guys. Uh, but, but I would have done anything. I would have said anything to keep my job. And that's, that's where I was at. Um, not proud of it. Just a fact of my life. With, um, with the producer role, uh, did you did you have like a, a short, uh, like not cooling off period? What do you call it? Like an apprenticeship almost as a producer? Yeah, no, it full-time? was. I was I was a producer there, and I did do uh, for a minute there. It was only me doing the live events, uh, all the live events as the road agent on the live events. So, uh, look. But again, active addiction, man, it was all about every day waking up and figuring out how I was going to get high, and then. Uh, Life happens around me, you know what I mean, and that's that's where I was at in that in that time period. Uh, so with TNA, you you leave that behind, you get clean, you go to WWE, you have a, a pretty darn stellar career in the office and, and helping uh, the kids out and the uh, yeah. you, you know main eventers all the way down to the uh, curtain jerkers, uh, which is probably a derogatory way of saying it, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. What did you find yourself telling wrestlers more than anything else? Just you just seem to be repeating yourself this one thing that no one ever took on board. Yeah. It, it, slow down. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, and it, it sounds like the old man that's bitter and, uh, you know, and it, it just sounds, but, but it's, it's slow down, man. Let things register, let things sell things. You don't have to go so fast. Um, and, and if you slow down, I'll get really good camera angles of your facials and stuff too, and make you a television star. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But if you're moving so fast that I can't, introduce your face to the viewing audience, then I'm just watching a, a tennis match and focusing on the ball. You know what I mean? Yeah, 
Absolutely. Um, what percentage of wrestlers did you work with that actually took your advice and what percentage didn't? I would say 80% didn't. Really? Yeah. And it's, and look, I get it, man. I do. I totally get it. I was them 30 years ago. And when Jack Lanza or, or a chief J strongbow or Pat Patterson or Renee Goulet or Tony Gurria, any of the agents during my time, if they told me anything, I thought, well, what does this old man know? You know what I mean? I literally thought that. And I wouldn't say that to their face, but I would go, okay. Yeah. And I'd walk away going, yeah, we'll have right. Whatever. And half the thing, 90, 90% of the things they told me, all came to be true. And if I would have listened, I would be better off for it. Um, but you got to go through that crap. You know what I mean? Look, I know what I see on TV and I see the car crash. So give me the keys. And that's what the boys are going to do. And they're going to give you that you every now and then you'll see them tell a good story and slow down and pick a body part. And, and it's so much more inviting uh, and, inv and, and, and easy to invest in. Well, yeah, I was going to say you see about five or six car crashes a week, really, with wrestling these days. This seems to be quite oh, a lot yeah. of being quick. Yeah, and, and here's the deal about watching a car crash. It's pretty cool, but I don't know the people in the car crash or else I would really be upset or so, – you know what I mean? So if I get to know the characters that are in that car crash, maybe I'm more emotionally involved – but you got to give me that opportunity to get to know you. And that's from repetitive television opportunities in a positive light. And it's hard to protect everybody. So you got to pick some and start pushing them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. As a producer, could you give me maybe a top three or maybe top five, however many you've got on the top of your head, uh, most proud moments as far as producing matches in big stages with main event talent? Well, look, I, I was only a producer for a short period of time until I joined the writing team and became a part of that. And then the lead writer of SmackDown, I would think I, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, Kofi mania. Um, like I was the writer of SmackDown during that. And like, that's to, to see that build to that, that, and then, then that match and uh, him win, like, I don't care what you do with the title the next day. The, 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 what I remember and what are water cooler moments, excuse me, water cooler conversations are moments, moments in time. And we created a friggin' really cool, uh, really beautiful moment in time with the build and everything. And, I, and so I'm really proud of that. Also proud of uh, storytelling we did with uh, AJ Styles and Samoa Joe uh, when we wrote the whole children's book, Night Night AJ and the whole deal. <laughs> like I uh, really, really proud of that stuff. Um, so as far as producing a match, look, anybody can produce a match. If you know what the spot's coming next, you can just call them to the truck and say, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what's the trick to being a great producer is, knowing the lingo, knowing the, uh, the director, knowing the guys in the truck, having that smooth, seamless conversation with them is m way more important than uh, helping some of these guys construct their match. Because, look, it's, they're going to construct their match and have a wrestling match. So my job as a producer, they changed it from agent to producer because my job as a producer now is to make it as presentable as possible on television. And so – that I only had a short period of time to do that, but but then I got uh, a lot of experience working with great guys who are great at that, like uh, Michael Hayes, like Jamie Noble. Um, some of these guys are just great communicators with who they're talking to, and and they know each other, and they create magic on television. Absolutely. Uh, you hinted before, say hinted, you told me, uh, that you were the SmackDown lead writer for a, quite a while, and I've heard you said, man, stressful too much pressure could yeah. you take me through uh maybe not a day but like a week of what it is like to be in that position and just maybe how much of a pressure cooker you're in to produce every week yeah yeah well look i mean you could you you can't fathom it because you you haven't experienced it and look the fans on twitter can't either uh <laughs> and they sure act like they can though bless their hearts but they <laughs> they it's it's uh 24 7 you're on call like I, I would, I would leave on Sunday afternoon from my home and fly to wherever raw was Monday night. We would do raw on Monday, which is 
if you're going to have any time to yourself, it's early morning because at noon to 11 or midnight, you're in that building. The next, that night you'd get on uh, me. I was blessed with the, to be able to get on the jet, um, fly to the next town, do the exact same thing all over again. Only that evening you fly to Stanford Wednesday, you're in the office and you're writing, uh, hopefully, uh, coming up with a lot of segments. You have 11 segments in the show coming up with some of the segments on Wednesday for the next, uh, Tuesday show they were at the time. Um, So then Thursday, you would have meetings again to come up with the show. And Thursday night, we would pitch to Vince. Uh, Sometimes you would get your show and he would go great. And that was the kiss of death because, you know, he really didn't look at it. (laughs) He's just saying great. (laughs) And when we get there on Monday, he's going to focus on it and we're going to make some changes. Um, But that he's the king and it's good to be the king. So uh, and so so then I would fly home Friday from Stanford, Connecticut. So I get home Friday late afternoon. Uh, I would sleep in my bed Friday, Saturday, probably on phone calls talking about uh, Vince may call and go, Hey, I remember you said this about such and such. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And you go, okay. And you have to stop everything. And right. So it's, you're literally on call 24 seven. And I understood the gig when I took it. Um, He just outworked me. He can outwork me. He's a, he's a workhorse. He's a workaholic. And, and it, it, I, that schedule I just read you, I did for seven years. You know what I mean? And, and it did, it wasn't easy. I was, I was newly sober. I was a year and a half sober when I started. So I white knuckled it for anybody who's in recovery. I white knuckled it a great deal during those seven years. And finally I just said, I can't do it no more. I'm not, I'm not going to do it anymore. You know what I mean? It was kind of like that. Uh, yeah, I'm done doing this. And so, so the NXT gig became available and I took that, of course. Yeah, man, I don't, I don't blame you. 200 hours a week, it sounds like. Can you uh, give me an example? I don't know if you did this, but I can't imagine you didn't. Rewrite a show while the show is on air. Uh, yes, a uh, hundred times, a thousand times. Oh, really? Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. The, the, Cause we would, we would write and send out like rewrite and send out the first six segments or something like that. So, you know, you got the first hour. So take this and go, we're going to finish doing this. But yeah, we did that a lot of times and look, truth be told, sometimes it's, it works. And sometimes you get a lot better stuff out of it because you're almost challenged to be more creative because you're, you're in a crunch for time. Um, and sometimes it didn't, sometimes it failed miserably and you go like, yeah, but, but that's, that's not up to me. It's not my company. Mm-hmm. It was my show, but even my show was not my show. You know what I mean? So, so uh, that's just, that, that's just the way you play the game and either you play the game or you quit. And I took my ball and, and went to NXT. Yeah. Uh, how many, I mean, we hear stories about the, you know, 400 uh, writers or whatever at any one time, how many writers did you have working under you? So as a team, uh, Team SmackDown was probably one, two, three, four, five, probably six, six writers and probably a writer assistant. Now, now three of those writers, myself being one of them, and I was included myself in that, by the way, um, myself, Steve Guerrero and uh, Johnny Russo, who now writes uh, NXT, uh, all traveled on the road. The other members of the team were home team members. So they would have to sit in on video calls on during the production meetings, but then they could sit for the rest of the day on Monday and Tuesday and talk about next week's show. And so what, by the time we got back, hopefully they would have some segments uh, at least to present and we could flush them out. Um, or sometimes they would, we would have them write out 11 segments and, and then we just go and pick like, oh, that's an awesome one right here. You know what I mean? And what stories are we trying to tell and whose idea was the best to tell it? Like that was, it was a collaboration, man. And look, I, I know people always talk negatively about that. Without that writing team, dude, it's, it, the cookie crumbles. And I can assure you that's the truth. I've seen it uh, from the neck up. Uh, I've seen it. That writing team does everything. Um and, and I and I can't give them enough credit because they do it under extreme pressure uh, and they do it gracefully. And and, you know, you do your job. You do what your boss tells you to do. I don't care if you work for Vince McMahon or uh, Jeff Bezos. If he says we're going to do this now, that's what we do now. You know what I mean? And so I don't know why people get so upset about it. He's messing with my wrestling. No, it's his wrestling. <laughs> 
I keep getting emails from Jeff Bezos offering me about six point five million dollars if I just email him back. I get I get one every ah. day from him, and also uh, uh, who's uh, the Rockefellers? I get that as well. I'll probably get yes. Vince McMahon next offering me uh, some money. Yeah, well, I just you I, probably I, get you probably get Ed McMahon <laughs> offering you money. That's an old American. I that. know who he is. He's the <laughs> okay. hi, he's the hi-o guy. Hi hi oh. If he's been yeah. in The Simpsons, I'll know who it is. Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's where you know him from. <laughs> yeah. I know him from the actual Tonight Show. Do you know? <laughs> I I'm, actually, not old. Uh, I'm sorry, this isn't about wrestling. Uh, I actually watched a documentary on um, John. Uh, what's he called? I've already blown it. What was uh, he called? No, John, Johnny A. Carson. Johnny Carson. I watched a documentary on that. What a fascinating dude. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. interesting. He was, yeah, he was uh, an innovator in Hollywood. You know what I mean? He was a, uh, a trailblazer. Mm. Yeah, great guy. I um I took like from when I'm doing these interviews I've taken one lesson from weirdly that specific documentary is that no matter how many shows he did over 29 years you never knew who he voted for you didn't know if he was Republican or Democrat yeah and yeah, why yeah, alienate 50 yeah. percent of your audience it's a great lesson it is a great lesson and it is it's it makes so much sense why would you want to alienate half of your audience? Just like you just said, it's, it's literally, we, we have to get along, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if, and if not mentioning how I believe or how I feel helps us get along, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut. WWE apparently is going back to TV 14. Now as well, the stalwarts of the attitude era, are you in favor or now you're a bit older daughters, granddaughters, you prefer a tamer product. Well, look, I uh, I worked up there so long under the PG era that that's kind of how I see my wrestling now. Um, what well, because and I'm yeah now that I'm older I do look at things differently and I do have granddaughters and I do think about sitting there and watching it with them, which is been the mantra for so long as we bring smiles to people's faces and 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 it's family friendly and. I don't know. I think it's, I think I like it better clean. I I would not have watched the barbed wire match. I watched last night with my granddaughter. She's five. You know what I mean? And there was every blood, blood everywhere. And, and, uh, people just miraculously thin enough to go through the bars. Um, when they couldn't Mm -hmm. unlock it, there was all kinds of miracles happen. Um, (laughs) but yeah, I wouldn't have watched that with my, and so, so look, I understand I also like dirty, grungy stuff, but I, I don't watch that stuff with my kids. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so I don't know, it's me sounding very hypocritical being in degeneration X and all of that. But look, when you grow up and people who are older like me, will 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 know I'm right. You evolve a little bit and you start to see things from a different perspective and it's what's important you know what i mean for me to chuckle at a, at a dick joke or for me and my granddaughter to spend some quality time together and not have to explain that trash you know what i mean so i, I don't know it's i'm up in the air i would love to see tv 14 by myself uh you know <laughs> after dark uh but but with my granddaughter i want it to be pg uh, just with uh, just as your sort of i suppose morality almost if it goes to tv 14 what would you find sort of more offensive uh gratuitous violence or sex or language which one of the three would bother you the most or most to least so so look probably the sex and i guess i'm i'm naive and and conservative and all the above and i and i'm okay with that uh that's that's what i'll be but i I just i would feel awkward sitting there with my grand i'm look i'm thinking about the experience of sitting with my granddaughter I, i could explain a fight I could explain. I don't want to explain anything sexual with a five-year-old. That's just where that's just where I draw the line, uh, especially if it's my granddaughter. It's just awkward, and so I think I think I could explain away a lot of violence, but uh, but I don't want to have to explain away. What's she doing, Paul? Paul. Mm. Uh- we will move on to the main event. I will thank you for your... I mean, assuming we get to our time limit, I've got maybe one more question, but I will give the main event and call it the firing line. Same as name, name association, but it's reversed. So yep. I'm going to give you some names and you just throw out what you think of them. I'm sure you're going to think they're all great guys for the most part and maybe a tiny story as well. First yep. story... Uh, first story. First name. Uh, uh, Tory. It's because I said... That's why I said story. Tory. Yeah, story. Tory. So, so look, I didn't, I didn't spend a whole lot of time around Tory, and I'm being honest with you. She was so great and nice. And we were worked well together. That was it. I never went 
to eat with her. I never went to a bar with her. I did. So I don't have a whole lot of uh, stories about Tori, only that she was willing to do anything uh, physically, you know, and get thrown off anything. She was a go-getter. Um, and I thought she was a great wrestler, but yeah, she was great to, to work with for that uh, period of time. But I didn't, I didn't get to know her that well. And I, I actually regret now that I think about it. Yeah. Uh, now this is a uh, Tori with one R and just an I, this is Tori Poach. Or Poch. I don't know how to pronounce her surname. Tori. Po- po- I have no idea who you're talking about now. Oh, uh, the one in DX 2000. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know how to pronounce her <laughs> so, last sorry, name. I, sorry, I, I threw that I, one yeah, out. So what, that's the one I was talking yeah. about, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <good laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian Christopher. Oh, man. Uh, God rest his soul, man. Look, Brian had his troubles, but, but you know, we all have. Um I don't know what happened at the end there, but look, I had some great, me and Brian butted heads a lot because we were very similar people, uh, you know, um, but we also had some great times together and some times together, like in a hotel room where when the maids came in, they thought it was the uh, Whitney Houston crime scene photos, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but we had some great times together. So yeah, look, I love Brian Christopher. I wish I could hug him right now. Well, I'm glad I never shared a room with you or Brian Christopher, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> Kevin Dunn. Look, I, look, Kevin's great at his job. And so you jump right to the positives in my mind. Mm-hmm. I understand why people don't like Kevin Dunn. Um, I've heard Ke- Kevin said things to me that I didn't like. And that if we were working at a gas station or a petrol station, as you might call it, uh, yes, uh, I would beat the crap out of him uh, <laughs> in between pump one and two. Um, however, that's not the way of the world. You know what I mean? It's not like that anymore. Kevin is a very powerful man and he's very good at his job. And so it's almost, I I compare it to Shawn Michaels and his in-ring work. If you're that good, you can say it. You know what I mean? You're allowed to say it. And so I, I understand why Kevin rubs people the wrong way, but he, he's earned his stripes and he's still earning them to this day. And I've never seen anybody as good running a show in that truck as Kevin Dunn. And that's, you know, I'll, I'll stay, I'll stay there. Yeah. Um, I've got to mention this one sentence. Anything that comes out of a box is over. Terry Funk came out of a box. (laughs) Yeah, he did come out of the box. Uh, What a great, horrible thing that was we we <laughs> ran up to the box and and then we, we heard the the chainsaw trying to start like rrr, rrr, rrr. we're just standing there like oh what is that uh and so that was felt like forever it, it turned out it was, it was so bad but oh uh, well it, people always say why couldn't he just be terry funk um and i get that but i i think it was Hello, everybody. Um, Road Dog's internet has completely died. I don't think it's just the internet. I think it's all the power. Pretty much everything is gone. So I'm going to wrap up the podcast for him. I'm going to do the plugs as well. So uh, Road Dog was very gracious of coming on this show to promote StarCast 5. I'll give all the plugs again. So it kicks off at the Nashville, um, Nashville Fairgrounds, July 29th, 31st, featuring a pack lineup including Ric Flair's final match, Four Horsemen Reunion, a number of live podcasts and spoken word shows, including Bret Hart reliving SummerSlam 1992, the main event with Davey Boy Smith. And also, and I did spot this, they didn't ask me to say this, uh, Midnight Karaoke with Father James Mitchell, which sounds excellent. So uh, you can catch... Uh, everything on Fight TV. If you can't get tickets, go to starcast.com for all the information about that. And also, I'll do the plugs for uh, Brian as well. So, the OU oh, No Didn't podcast, you can get that from any anywhere you get podcasts. There's the YouTube channel, and Road Dog is also on Twitter at Brian R D James. All the links are up there. There's a link tree as well. Link tree, sorry, link tr.ee forward slash you didn't know pod. I'll put all the links down in the description but for now uh, on behalf of road dog who can't be here because uh, his power is is completely disappeared he thanks you for watching i thank you for watching and tune in again next week